The terms media and communication are very often presented to us as a couplet. Sometimes they're even used interchangeably. But communication is a broad idea with a long history, and the arrival of media technologies is usually seen as making possible special forms of communication. Communication in which physical co-presence was unnecessary, and later, technologies that not only allow communication at a distance, but near instantaneous interaction. In this way, communication technologies are often seen as altering how we experience time, space, distance, and locality. Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media understood as technologies. We explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will be students on my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on these themes in more detail. This episode is the second in our series, focused on communication technologies. This title might sound a little generic, The main idea I want to get across is this. Communication is still most often understood as symbolic, as freed from physical transportation. But communication technologies are always embedded in and help to produce material times and spaces. Let's start with communication technologies as part of a process called time-space compression. But before we get into that concept, let's first engage with one of communication studies' most well-worn historical accounts, the so-called print revolution. The invention of the printing press around 1450 is usually associated with Johann Gutenberg of Mainz, Germany. Gutenberg did not invent the printing press per se, but rather a metal movable type printing system. This system allowed for various arrangements of metal pieces, individual letters and punctuation, to form larger blocks of text, which could then create ink impressions on paper. It was a system that was novel for Western Europe, but similar movable systems of ideograms with carved wood or stone blocks were already well established in China and Japan. Gutenberg's metal movable type facilitated the printing of a relatively cheap yet good quality version of the Bible, which came to be known as the Gutenberg Bible. The story that usually follows is that this development heralded the fundamental change of the last millennium, the print revolution, a revolution that led to the Renaissance, the widespread dissemination of printed matter such as books, newspapers, laws, and scientific literature, the arrival of nation states, democracies, and bureaucracies. For some, however, the story of print is not quite one of a single pivotal revolution. Harold Innes, a Canadian communication historian, suggested the print medium be seen as embodying a new kind of bias, a space bias. In his 1951 book, The Bias of Communication, Innes introduced the notion of communication media expressing either a space bias or a time bias. Time bias media are characterized as long-lasting forms of communication, often spanning generations, yet they reach limited audiences as they typically rely on oral traditions. Time bias media tend to support stable community as well as more traditional values, even religious values. They tend to be orientated to sharing, fellowship, or association. Space bias media, like print or later broadcasting, are characterized by far briefer moments of exposure, yet they are lightweight and can achieve much wider distribution. Space bias media tend to bring about fast societal change, materialism, secularism, and the establishment of nations and empires they tend to support communication as a form of control. Now, in our last episode, I briefly mentioned Marshall McLuhan's 1962 book, The Gutenberg Galaxy. This book was dedicated to Harold Innes, who had been McLuhan's senior colleague at the University of Toronto. McLuhan agreed with Innes's medium-focused analysis of print as enabling mass-scale industry, nationalism, and capitalism. But from this, McLuhan had a characteristically grand argument to make, that the invention of writing, and then print, led to a new type of consciousness. Very much foregrounding his later claim that the medium is the message, McLuhan argued that print was not simply an invention by people for people's use. Rather, print reinvented human society and the human psyche. 
In traditional oral cultures, communication entailed emotionally laden speech. McLuhan claimed that the phonetic alphabet, and then mass printing, eroded this emotional dimension. These mediums created a linear, individualistic, western, Gutenberg man. McLuhan suggested that the emotional, and perhaps less linear and more collective, qualities of electronic media such as television might be leading us to a return of tribalization and oral roots. Television, McLuhan predicted, might allow a more village-like mentality to be translated to the mass and even global scale. And this is the meaning of McLuhan's other often quoted, but usually misunderstood catchphrase, the global village. There are arguments that the revolutionary nature of Gutenberg's movable type invention is overstated. S.D. Noam Cook, writing in 2006, reminds us that Gutenberg's Bible was actually a highly conservative use of mechanical book production. Gutenberg sought to make his Bible look as much like a traditional handwritten manuscript as possible, and it was not produced at a mass scale. Only around 200 copies were produced. But Cook argues that there's a deeper problem with the prevailing Gutenberg myth. This is the overemphasis it has on a single invention bringing about mass literacy and communication. It ignores other important developments, such as the development of affordable and abundant paper as a medium to print on, or the development of mass public literacy. These developments, Cook says, quote, are not caused by the appearance of a single gadget, they are constituted in multiple influencing technological and social innovations, end quote. So let's come back to this notion of time-space compression. It's a concept that's been important to geographers, such as David Harvey and Doreen Massey. It argues that geography, particularly after the Industrial Revolution, cannot simply be understood as a collection of fixed places like cities and towns between which we can measure objective distances in miles or kilometers. The geographical points you see on a map are made nearer and further from each other through their connections and disconnections with technologies of transportation, such as trains, road networks, seafaring ships, as well as technologies of communication, such as printed materials, the telegraph, satellites, or the internet. For example, although Penzance in Cornwall is about 100 miles closer to London than Edinburgh in Scotland, the quality of transportation and communication technologies between London and Edinburgh mean that these two locations are actually closer to each other relationally. Now, I've only presented a partial account of what time-space compression means. The concept is also very much about the historical development of capitalism. It builds on Karl Marx's notion of the annihilation of space by time. For our purposes, what's important to keep in mind is that communication technologies have historically reduced the effects of physical distance. Today, many of our communication technologies, such as video conferencing, allow us to connect to distant others in apparent real time. But even industrial area technologies went to extensive mechanical and human effort to come as close to this kind of speed as possible. A notable and fascinating example of this is the railway post office, seen in the UK and elsewhere. The railway post office located mail sorting practices within the moving train carriage. And this carriage did not need to stop along the way, since a bag and hook apparatus was invented, which allowed the pickup and drop off of mail bags without stopping. We come now to what is often seen as a historical turning point in these processes of time-space compression, at least according to James Carey's 1989 essay, The Telegraph and Ideology. This essay has become one of the most cited works in the history of communication technologies. It has received a resurgence of interest in recent years. It offers many insights into how media technologies bring transformations not so much on their own, but in their interconnection with related organizational settings, technologies, and systems. Carey chose the telegraph not just to discuss a historically important communication technology, but as an example to understand his contemporary situation, at least as it was in the late 20th century. Carey explains his thinking here in an interview with Frank Moretti. I started out focusing my attention not on the telegraph, but with another kind of question. And that was, if I wanted to see today what satellite broadcasting and computers were doing, what effect they were having, where would I look? And my thought was, well, I'd first of all look at airlines, that the computer and the airlines grow up together. One can't be understood without the other. I'd look at the banking system. 
particularly the growth of an international uh, banking system. That is, there are a number of sites that I thought that one might see this. I said, if I were to look at the 19th century, the parallel would obviously be the telegraph. Where would I look for that? Well, instead of the airlines, I'd look at the railroads. I might look at the banking system, but I'd also look at the stock markets and the commodity markets. So that the interest in the telegraph was always an interest in today, but in settings distant enough, somewhat simpler and clearer, that one might gain some uh, insight into the contemporary by looking at the historical. Carey's approach shares affinities with the medium theory of Marshall McLuhan, but there are some important differences. McLuhan came from a humanities background. He had originally taught English and was initially fascinated by how things like poetry and later comics were best understood for their formal qualities rather than their content. Carey, by contrast, was an economist. He was also interested in the formal qualities of media, but unlike McLuhan, less so for their psychic or sensual consequences. Carey was more focused on how communication technologies help reshape markets, economic practices, indeed entire economies. In this respect, he was more aligned with McLuhan's senior colleague at the University of Toronto, Harold Innes. For Carey, the telegraph is one of the most historically important communication technologies, yet also one of the least studied. He argued in his essay that this is highly unfortunate, for four main reasons. First, the telegraph was dominated by one of the first communication empires, Western Union, one of the earliest examples of patent struggles around media and communication technologies, with major implications for American law. It's comparable to debates about Microsoft's dominance of business operating systems today, or Apple's walled garden of hardware and apps, or concerns about Facebook's social media monopoly. A second reason Carey thought it unfortunate the Telegraph was so little studied was its foundational place in establishing what became the electrical goods industry, and in connection, electrical engineering, and more generally know-how systems and procedures related to the channeling of electrical signals. The third major blind spot around the Telegraph was how, Carey noted, it, quote, brought about changes in the nature of language, of ordinary knowledge, of the very structures of awareness, end quote. Initially, the telegraph was very much like a trivial toy, used for things like playing long-distance chess, not unlike early uses of computers. But in time, it became a new way of reporting on the world, focusing on recency and newness. It changed expectations of how and how fast new knowledge ought to circulate. But finally, Carey comes to his fourth and most central claim about the importance of the telegraph, that it changed the very idea of communication. With the telegraph, messages could be, quote, separated from the physical movement of objects, end quote. And these physical objects could be controlled by apparently non-physical means. Many years ago, I was rummaging through antique books, magazines, pamphlets, and maps in Spitalfields Market near the city of London. Eventually, I came across an interesting 1922 map. Along the top was the title, Western Europe, Communications. These communications included, for the most part, transport routes, such as roads, railways, and canals. This is not so surprising. If you look at historical sources, it is easy to find communication defined as including physical transportation. In his 2017 book, Communications and Mobility, David Morley describes his experience of finding his old dictionary defining communication as, quote, an act of imparting, especially news, information given, intercourse, common door or passage, or road or rail or telegraph between places. Although, as we will see, Carey was more interested in the economic and organizational consequences of the telegraph, a key point he makes is that the telegraph marked a separation of communication from physical transportation. For the first time, the telegraph allowed for a new kind of instantaneous communication across distances. In his 1995 book, The Media and Modernity, John Thompson calls this the novel experience of despatialized simultaneity. And for this, the telegraph was seen as mysterious, almost magical, perhaps divinely inspired. Some branches of organized religion in the United States saw it as a new way to circulate the word of God. And more generally, it heralded hopeful projections about the breaking down of differences, of shared understandings and new equalities. Sound familiar? Carey points out that there were precursors to these novel developments. The telegraph's electronically mediated systems of signals were preceded by optical forms of telegraphy. Semaphores were used to communicate with sailboats or steamships arriving into ports. 
These early technologies used line of sight to display a system of visual signals from hilltops or taller buildings, visible to faraway observers with a telescope. In the early stages of the U.S. Civil War, the Signal Corps used flag telegraphy, based on similar principles as semaphores, though the same Signal Corps later laid wired telegraph cables on the battlefield. Madalena and Packer have suggested in a 2014 article published in Theory, Culture, and Society that the, quote, docile bodies of flag telegraphy can be understood as an early precursor not only to the electric telegraph, but to later digitize communication. Perhaps obviously, the simultaneity of telegraphic communications had implications for how we experience time. Today, most people around the world take for granted standardized time and time zones. Increasingly, our mobile devices synchronize time for us, more or less automatically, perhaps further naturalizing a timeless idea of time. But, as Kerry points out, until 1883 in the United States, all time was set locally. People set their time according to the visual or auditory signals of the local sundial, the courthouse, the train station, the church, or jewelers. But with the growth of railways, local time created more and more havoc. Telegraphs helped make possible coordinated time zones, which were initially a pure grid, but eventually more sympathetic to political or ecological geographies. Kerry's essay on the telegraph is full of interesting insights. It's not surprising that it's been so widely discussed. It provided, for instance, new ways of thinking about imperialism. By 1897, the British Empire extended around the world. In the colonial era, its far-flung territories were ruled by dispersed governors and administrators who periodically communicated with London via seafaring vessels and written correspondence. The telegraph made possible a new, centralized, and near-to-real-time form of efficient, coordinated imperial control. The essay also provides new insights into the massive ramifications the telegraph had for journalism and news. The telegraph led to the establishment of wire news services. These services fed newspapers of many political stripes in many different locations. So wire services and wire news needed to be objective or nonpartisan and placeless, stripped of local or regional colloquialisms. News circulating through telegraphic communications became a commodity that was to be measured, compressed, timed, and transported. It was costed by the word, so wire stories focused on bare facts. This had cultural as well as economic consequences. Ernest Hemingway, Kerry notes, became obsessed with the subtle poetry of Cabalese, a language that was pared down, shorn of adornments. Given his background in economics, Kerry also has a lot to say in the essay about how the telegraph helped reshape financial markets. Before the telegraph, market trading primarily centered on arbitrage, the difference of price between geographical markets. For example, the price of wheat in Boston versus that in New York City. The telegraph made price information between different geographically dispersed markets much more readily available to all. As a result, markets swung to futures, trading on the possible prices of a commodity over time. From this emerged a new commodity fetishism, or abstraction. Markets became increasingly decontextualized. When we speak today of the market, we do not often mean a specific place. Commodities could be bought and sold without the physical exchange of that commodity. Commodities became something that could be standardized and graded. Time still dominates financial markets today, but to new, computationally driven extremes. There is now a market subset of traders called high-frequency traders. This is a kind of trading driven by algorithms which buys and sells huge numbers of orders in a fraction of a second. No doubt a trader would think I'm putting it crudely. But high frequency trading is about taking advantage of the difference in price in that narrow slice of time between when an order is requested by a normal buyer and when they are quoted a price. Multi-million dollar projects are afoot to establish straighter fiber optic cables between major trading centers like New York, London, Chicago, and Tokyo. High-frequency traders will pay millions per year to access the extra 4 to 5 milliseconds provided by these new communication lines, but they could gain billions of profits for their investment. On the surface, Kerry's essay on the telegraph seems to emphasize how communication became severed from physical transportation. But dig a little deeper, and you'll find that it's also very much about how we should always think of transportation and communication as interlinked. The telegraph may have changed the meaning of communication, separating it from physical transportation, 
but it also needed infrastructure, such as wires and cables. And these were actually built along the paths of previous transportation routes, such as roads, railways, and canals. This is similar to how, today, broadband internet is being expanded in London using the existing underground railway tunnels. One of the most striking points that Kerry makes towards the end of the essay is how the telegraph eventually became a new way to control transportation and thereby enhance its speed and effectiveness. For example, the telegraph made it possible to remotely control faraway railway switches and signals. As Jonathan Stern puts it in his chapter of the 2006 edited book, Thinking with James Carey, when we say the telegraph severed communication from transportation, we need to think in terms of scale. At the scale of individual experience, the telegraph largely did separate communication from transportation. But if you look at the scale of a system, they interact. Specifically, the telegraph and the railway were part of a, quote, intertwined process, a massive assemblage of organized movement in space. The broader point is not just that communication and transportation are interlinked, it is that all media and communication depend on and produce material geographies. As the Internet of Things continues to grow at a rapid rate, sensors and devices are becoming more commonplace to communicate information. One of the most obvious in ways in which media technologies today are tied with material geographies is the huge expansion of location-based and location-aware technologies. Digitized technology and ordinary network devices are becoming increasingly pervasive parts of our lives. For example, in wearable media such as Apple Watch or Fitbits, not to mention the expansion of the so-called Internet of Things, the connecting of ordinary appliances and objects such as fridges or home lighting to digital networks. But the connections between media and geography are long-standing, and illustrated well by accounts of the historical codependencies of communication and transportation. The relationship between television and post-war suburban residential development in the United States and the UK is a striking example. In his 1974 book, Television, Technology, and Cultural Form, Raymond Williams argued that the normalization of suburban living, of the family home, of privacy, living far from one's place of work, these were not only made possible by transportation technologies like automobiles or motorways or cars, but by television. Television made it possible to connect to a public world from the private home. Indeed, so important was having a television in the early model suburban community of Levittown in Long Island, New York, that television sets were actually incorporated structurally into the houses being sold, so that buyers could include them in their mortgage payments. In this sense, as David Morley argues in Communication and Mobility, television can be seen as a kind of transport or travel, not so much physical travel, but mental travel, taking viewers from one realm to another, for example, being presented images of inner city issues from the seclusion of a suburban home. What's important, however, is that television can only operate in this way in conjunction with other transportation technologies and material geographies. For Morley, the links of transportation and communication are more evident than ever. However, in many cases, the importance of these links are largely concealed. An example he cites is maritime transport. The movement of commodities across water remains the slow, hidden bulk handler of much global exchange today. Maritime transport largely involves commodities being organized into containers, a kind of standardization similar to digitization, where everything is reduced to ones and zeros. And these containers can only be sorted and rooted in the way they are today, thanks to the communication and increasingly digital backbone in which they're based. So containers are a kind of media infrastructure. And recently, they have become a leggy, congested infrastructure. Boxes of goods have been piling up in Chinese factories during the COVID-19 pandemic because there's a global shortage of empty containers caused by delays in European and American ports. Of course, here we could also pivot to Amazon, a platform that has grown substantially during the pandemic. It's a paradigmatic example of the interconnections between the transmission of information and the transportation of commodities. We will explore some of these questions around media infrastructure, as well as digital platforms, in the episodes to come. Until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media, Technology, and Culture.